As entrepreneurs, we're constantly making bets. We're gamblers. We bet our time and money in the hopes of earning more. Most of the time we lose. But when we win, we win big. But betting in business isn't like gambling in a casino. In a casino, the odds are always against you. The house always wins. But in business, as you slowly learn skills, you can tip those odds in your favor. And that means eventually, with enough skill, you can become the house. And this book attempts to help you do just that, to hit that thousand run life-changing winner. The author explains that the way to do that is through what he calls a grand slam offer. An offer is what you're providing to a customer in return for money. And if you can make a grand slam offer, it'll be so good that you can earn enough money to retire forever. And that's exactly what the author of this book, Alex Ormosi, did. He tells the story of losing everything to a shady business partner. Then, armed with only one offer and a $100,000 limit on an old business credit card, he turned it around. He went from losing $3,300 a day to making $3 million in profit in the next 12 months. Since then, he's gone on to build a portfolio of businesses worth well over $100 million. And now he creates content teaching other entrepreneurs how to do it themselves. In this book, he aims to share the skill of making offers that generate enormous profits. He does that by using a combination of pricing, value, and enhancements. In this video, we'll break down each of these components. A Grand Slam offer aims to solve the two most common problems entrepreneurs face. One, not enough clients, and two, not enough cash. Before getting into these problems and making a Grand Slam offer, let's first define it. To understand a Grand Slam offer, you first need to understand a regular offer. All businesses work on a value exchange, a trade of money for value. The offer is what starts this trade. What will you provide in return for the money? The quality of the offer decides how much profit you make and how many clients you get. A Grand Slam offer results in fantastic profit, insane business, and ultimately freedom. This part really hit home for me. I've been in businesses whose offers were in this bottom and middle section, and it sucks. I've also been in some businesses whose offers were between these two. So I can only imagine what it's like when you really hit it out of the park. So let's talk about how a Grand Slam offer does that. The first component of a Grand Slam offer is pricing. The author explains the problem created by pricing and how to solve it in two parts. First, the commodity problem. There are two kinds of purchases, price-driven, and value-driven. Most companies' offers accidentally become price-driven purchases. Their work gets commoditized. Their offer is comparable to someone else's. So in order to get more clients, they must keep driving down the price until they're all fighting just to keep the lights on. The power of a Grand Slam offer is it allows you to sell your products based on value, not price. This allows you to get customers to pay more and get more customers, which solves both of the problems we talked about earlier. A value-based offer is different from anything else on the market. It means you're no longer getting commoditized and you can sell in the category of one. It does this by combining an attractive promotion, an unmatchable value proposition, and a premium price, alongside an unbeatable guarantee with payment terms that allow you to get paid to get new customers. But even the best offer is useless if you're not targeting the right market. So let's talk about how you do that. If you were going to open a hot dog stand and you could only have one competitive advantage, what would it be? You might say location, quality, price, or the taste, but you'd be wrong. The author explains that the best advantage is a starving crowd. You could make the worst, most expensive hot dogs and still sell out if you're the only stand in front of a sports stadium when the game ends. Even if you're not very good, you can still win in business if there's loads of demand for your solution. So how do you find a starving crowd? Well, the author breaks it down into four steps. One, massive pain. Your market must need, not want, your solution. For that to be true, you must find a market where the problem is painful. It frustrates your potential clients about their lives. The book has a great phrase, the pain is the pitch. If you can make it clear that you understand the pain the potential client is feeling, they'll feel heard and are more likely to buy your solution. But even all the pain in the world doesn't help if your market is missing the next point, purchasing power. Your audience needs to be able to afford your solution. For example, building a high ticket product for unemployed people simply won't work. They need to have the money to buy what you're selling. And if they want to buy and can afford your offer, you need to make sure they're easy to target. This one's pretty simple, but for example, don't start a business where your offer targets people without an internet connection. It's not impossible, but it'll make things much harder. Now, if you've got all of these, there's only one more area to focus on. You need to target a growing market. The author explains that a growing market is like a tailwind. Everything's easier in it. Demand is increasing, so it's easy for your sales to increase with it. On the other hand, in a shrinking market, you're trying to fight against it. So just don't do it. So once you have a market, we need to return to that definition of a business we had before, value for money. To get someone to make a value-based purchase, you need to increase the price to value discrepancy. By doing this, you avoid the commoditized pricing problem we covered earlier. There are only two ways to do this, decrease the price or increase the value. Most people will aim to reduce the price to get people to buy. But getting people to buy isn't the objective, making money is. When you decrease the price, you decrease the emotional investment and perceived value. You reduce the results the client gets as they're not as invested, plus you attract the worst, 
least committed customers. On top of that, you can't hire the best people to make the best product because there's no money in your business. If you flip this the other way, as you increase the price, you increase the emotional investment. You'll get better, more committed clients, better results for your clients, and better staff to help make a better product. There's even proof that customers consider a more expensive product better, even if it's identical to a cheaper competitor. In a blind taste test, researchers gave consumers three identical glasses of wine and asked them to rate them. Unsurprisingly, the consumers consistently rated them in order of price. The most expensive was the best, and the cheapest was the worst. This study shows how linked high prices are to perceived value. But no one will buy anything if you increase the price without increasing the perceived value. So if we want to charge a high price, we need to increase the discrepancy between price and value. Creating value traditionally is a very vague concept. However, this is where I think the book is most uniquely helpful. The author has created a value equation. Here it is. Dream outcome multiplied by perceived likelihood of achievement over time delay multiplied by effort and sacrifice. If you can maximize the top and minimize the bottom, you create the most value possible. Interestingly, he points out that most people focus on that top section early in their careers. Let's say that your dream outcome is to learn to code. You could hypothetically maximize the top by saying a buyer will become the best programmer in the world which is pretty good. If you minimized the bottom though, they could hypothetically learn to code the second they buy your product, and that is even better. And obviously this isn't possible in the real world, but the closer you can get to that, the better. The book's also got an excellent tip for each one of these components. For the dream outcome, you must channel the buyer's desire. You must show them that you understand the client's reality and where they're trying to get to, and that your offer can close the gap between them. Also, remember to focus on status when discussing a dream outcome. The more status someone gains as a result of achieving your dream outcome, the more they will want it. For the perceived likelihood of achievement, think about what you can do to make it impossible for them to fail. You could do this by providing massive support or just providing a guarantee. If you can remove the risk of someone losing their money without getting what they want, then there's no way they can end up in a bad situation. For time, break this down into two. Number one, the long-term outcome, what they want, which is why they buy. Number two, the short-term experience, why they stay the course to get what they want. You can make that second point work better by making sure that your client gets a big emotional win as early as possible in the process of using your product. Doing this will increase their momentum and increase the chance that they succeed. Finally, consider both the psychological and physical components of effort and sacrifice. What will they not be able to do or have to do to get your dream outcome? At this stage in particular, perception comes into play. The easier you can make something feel, the more valuable it is. As the author says, Perception is reality. It's not just about how much you increase their likelihood of success or decrease their effort. That alone isn't valuable. What's valuable is how they perceive the decrease in effort and sacrifice. Perception has been considered in product design for as long as I'm aware of, so it's interesting to see how it can also apply to business. My favorite example of this is the elevator story. A building manager was getting complaints from the tenants in his apartment building about the wait time for elevators. They were so serious that the tenants were threatening to move out. So the building manager explored every option on how to make them faster. It just wasn't possible. But then he made one small change that reduced the complaints to zero. He added mirrors to the waiting area, so people were too busy looking at themselves to notice the wait times. It wasn't about decreasing the wait time, it was about making it less apparent. If you apply this thinking to every component of the value equation, you'll be onto a winner. When you build out your offer, you'll look at many solutions to each component of the value equation, and how you combine these components will determine how easy to sell or fulfill the offer is. But what's the relationship between these? Well, put simply, the easier something is to sell, the harder it is to fulfill, and the easier it is to fulfill, the harder it is to sell. The author calls this the sales to fulfillment continuum. If you do something for a client, it's very easy to sell and very time consuming to do. But if you provide them with the tools to do it themselves, it takes much less time from you, but will be harder to sell. So which should you prioritize? Well, the author says to first make something easy to sell and hard to fulfill. Then once you're at capacity, i.e. you can't take any more clients, adjust your offer to make it slightly harder to sell and easier to fulfill and then keep doing that each time this happens. I found this section incredibly eye-opening. Most of these ideas feel like common sense when you hear them out loud, but having a clear framework makes it much easier to nail each one of them when designing an offer. Since I read this, I've also been looking at other people's products and ads to see how they construct their offer, which combination of components they use to make you want to buy. I also made a Notion template based on this framework that I've used to design my own offers. And if you want to get that for free, you can click the link in the description. What I found even more interesting than the value equation though, was this next part. The author says that how you enhance the offer is actually more important than the offer itself. Let me show you. There are five components to enhancing an offer. The more you can add to your offer, the easier it will be to sell. All of these components rely on a well-known concept, supply and demand. 
The more you want something, the more ready you are to buy it. Interestingly, desire actually comes from not getting what you want. As soon as you get something, you no longer desire it. Therefore, if we want to increase desire, aka demand, we must delay satisfying our clients' desires. Using these components, you can limit supply and increase demand to maximize your revenue. So the first step is scarcity. Humans are actually more motivated to hoard something scarce than act on something that could help them. Put simply, the fear of loss is greater than the desire for gain. So if you can demonstrate scarcity in your offer, you'll increase someone's desire to buy it. The book goes into many ways to do this, but some of the most simple and ethical ways are as follows. One, just be honest about your capacity. If you can only manage five clients, advertise that. If you sell products, make sure to buy slightly fewer Fewer than you think you can sell in each order so that you always sell out. And you don't just have to limit access to your core offer. You could also restrict access to bonuses or add one-off extras. Now, similar to scarcity is urgency. Rather than limiting the number of clients you can take or the products you can sell, you can limit the time in which they can buy them. There are four simple ways to do this. One, cohorts. If your product requires customers to start at the same time or in groups, you can use that to increase their desire to buy. If buying now means they can start quickly, rather than waiting for the next time around, they'll be more motivated to buy. 2. Seasonal urgency. You can attach an offer to a physical end date, usually in line with a season or holiday. 3. Bonus and prices. Make extra bonuses only available for a short period, or advertise that the price of the offer will permanently go up after a certain time frame. 4. Exploding opportunity. This is only relevant if you're offering a solution in a market that's suddenly growing. You can create urgency due to the fact that the product gets less valuable the later someone gets it. Next, bonuses. The core concept here is that a single offer feels less valuable than the same thing broken down into its components and stacked as bonuses. If you establish a product's price and then add bonuses, it creates a much greater perceived value. To make this the most effective, you want the value of the bonuses to be greater than the value of the core offer itself. And to supercharge this even further, add scarcity and urgency to the bonuses. If you present your offer this way, you create a much greater perceived value to price discrepancy, which makes it much easier to sell. Now, as I mentioned earlier, risk is the greatest blocker to someone buying something. What if it doesn't do what I want it to do? Well, you can add guarantees. There are many options here, but the simplest two are conditional and unconditional guarantees. 30 days money back, no questions asked, is an unconditional guarantee, which works best for cheaper products that are easy to fulfill. Get your money back if you don't hit your goal in 30 days after completing every step is a conditional guarantee and works better for more expensive, harder to fulfill products. To make these more powerful, you can name them and stack these guarantees to create even more confidence. And the final enhancer is creating names for your offer, bonuses, and guarantees. The author shows a simple formula for naming called the magic headline formula. The goal is to use three to five components of the formula in each name. Let's go through it. M is make a magnetic reason. Explain why you're making the offer or why they should respond to it. A is announce the avatar. Who is your ideal client? Who isn't? Be as specific as possible. G is give them a goal. This is your dream outcome. And the more tangible it is, the better. I is for indicate a time interval. How long will something take? Just a note, you can't use this on some paid ads for money or health goals. So be careful with this one. C is complete it with a container word. Show that it's a unique bundle of solutions to get your outcome. Then, if you can, make it rhyme or alliterate to make it even catchier. The scariest part of being an entrepreneur is that there's no guide. There's no clear path. You can't learn it in school. There's no textbook for creating a business. And that's what this book attempts to solve. It reads like a textbook, it looks like a textbook, and it's ready to be read and reread each time you need to make an offer. And making a bet when you have a textbook on how to win is a whole lot less scary. Hopefully, this will give you the confidence to take that big swing, knowing that you might fail, but take it anyway. After all, you've only got to win once to change your life, be able to retire forever, and be free. Thank you so much for watching.